This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. On March 23, 1904, in San Antonio, Texas, Annabelle Johnson Lesseur gave birth to a little girl, whom she and her husband Thomas named Lucille Fay. Lucille was the couple's third child. Another daughter, Daisy, had died in infancy, and Lucille's brother, Hal, had been born the previous year. Many years later, when little Lucille was the famous woman known to the world as Joan Crawford, the year of her birth would mysteriously change to 1906 or 1908. Tom Lesseur was of French-Canadian extraction. He worked as a contractor, and his assignments frequently took him out of San Antonio. One day, when Lucille was still a small child, he left for a job and never came back. After her husband's abandonment, Anna became very bitter, but she was determined to do the best she could for herself and her two children. Anna moved Hal and Lucille out of their shabby, rented apartment, and together they all made their way to Lawton, Oklahoma, where Anna hoped life would be better. It wasn't long before she met the town's most interesting citizen and most eligible bachelor, Harry Casson, owner of the local opera house which put on various forms of entertainment. When the relationship between Harry and Anna became more serious, Anna managed to track down her first husband and get a divorce. Realizing that another man would now care for his wife and pay for his children's needs, Lesseur was eager to agree to Anna's terms. Anna married Thomas out of love, but she married Harry Casson for security. Little Lucille, now known as Billy Casson, fell in love with show business. She spent time backstage at the opera house, mingled with the artists, and dreamed of going on the stage herself someday and garnering applause. These hurried encounters were strictly for quick thrills and occasionally control and had nothing to do with Joan's romantic feelings for, or engagement to, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. during this period. Joan was like a man, at least how we see some men, in that she could be in love with someone and see nothing wrong in having meaningless sex with others. Joan did not like to be rejected, but who does, Asher said. She once told me about the guys who rejected her. If they're gay, they're forgiven, but if they're straight, never. A lot of Joan's forgiveness had to do with the manner in which the rejection came. It did not necessarily impress her if a man was married or engaged, because she knew how many men cheated on their wives and fiancés, and basically assumed that everybody cheated at one time or another as she did. But if she sensed that a man sincerely didn't want to cheat, then she would let it pass, especially if it was someone she wasn't that interested in. She wouldn't necessarily blackball a guy because he wouldn't sleep with her, Asher said. It's more that she'd rather make a picture with a compatibly randy fellow, Clark Gable, for instance, than a less pliable Johnny Mac Brown.